Hi, in this video we're gonna cover traffic steering low-level configuration. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to mention that there are multiple ways how to configure traffic steering in the Versa SD-WAN networks. Uh, there are simple ways through the Versa Titan, through the Versa Concerto or through the workflows, but if you want to achieve the uh, biggest granularity in the configuration, so it's going to be the most flexible configuration, you would need to do low-level config. And this video will cover uh, all the details about it. So the agenda. First, we're going to review traffic steering components. Then we're going to review how they track with each other. We'll talk in details about the SD-WAN policies, rules, forwarding profiles, SLA probes, uh, SLA path policies, and SLA profiles. So let's begin. There are three main components of the SD-WAN traffic steering in the Versa networking. Uh, they can answer the following questions. What needs to be steered? So when we define what kind of applications your URLs needs to be matched to be steered a certain way, how it should be steered, which circuits should be taken, and maybe some of the load balancing or replication settings, and when it should be steered the, that way. Like, for example, uh, when the path is considered SLA compliant or non-SLA compliant and we need to fill over somewhere else. So in the Versa SDN, this all is divided into three sections. Those are SD-WAN policies and rules, forwarding profiles, and SLA profiles. How all of these components interact together? We have policies where we define rules. In the rules, we create match conditions. For example, match certain application or match certain source IP address or maybe destination IP address or any other condition. And there can be a limited number of the rules which you can create. Then, when you create rules inside of this policy, you can reference forwarding profiles where we answer the question how it should be steered. For example, we can select to use MPLS circuit by default and fill over to the internet and enable for their correction, or maybe use internet and fill over to the two, or maybe load balance and so on. And the way how it should be steered can be referenced from the rule. For example, rule one, when it's matching on the application, can say that this certain application should use MPLS by default. And we can use the forwarding profile, uh, for example, number two, by the rule number two, when we will say that all the traffic which is sourced from this IP address should be taking internet and forward to the internet two and avoid MPLS. And by the way, the forwarding profiles can be reused and referenced by many of the rules. So the forwarding profile by itself doesn't do anything. This is just the rule of how you should forward the traffic which was matched in the rule. And lastly, we have the SLA profiles, which will answer the question when it should be forwarded. For example, in the SLA profile, we can define threshold, which can be referenced by the forwarding profile. Uh, one of the examples, uh, the higher threshold can be the, uh, the delay when we can say that in the forwarding profile one, if the MPLS path is below 1% packet loss or 2% packet loss, and when it's less than 100 milliseconds, it is SLA compliant and we should use MPLS. But if the MPLS becomes more than 100 milliseconds or more than 2% packet loss, we should fail over to the internet. And once again, the SLA profiles is just the thresholds which can be referenced from any of the forwarding profiles and can be reused multiple times. Now let's go and review in details SD-WAN policies. First of all, uh, there can be only one SD-WAN policy which is active at one point of time. In the SD-1 policy, we can have unlimited number of the rules, but the policy which will be applied on your device uh, can be uh, only one. All SD-1 rules are directional, so you can create separate rules for the forward flow and reverse flows. Uh, also, rules have very strict order, so the, uh, there can be multiple rules, and the first rule which matches the criteria or, or which answers the question what is going to be steered, that one is going to be executed and all others will stop evaluation. 
you can uh, define to steer the traffic or maybe to even drop it or even maybe to skip the rule if the conditions are not right. And of course, uh, SDN policies and the rules can only be applied to the transit traffic. What this means that it can be applied only to the transit traffic? It means that if you will originate some traffic from the SD-WAN device, it cannot uh, follow the uh, SD-WAN rules. Only something that traverses through the burst SD-WAN uh, can be used in combination with the rules and the policies. If you generate traffic from the box itself, it will never match any of the policies or rules. Okay, now another thing. You cannot apply SD-WAN rule to the reverse flow, which is not going toward the SD-WAN. We will go into the details of what it is and how it is in the future slides. For now, uh, just take it for granted. And now, first we need to review what are the flows and what are the sessions. Imagine that we have Verse OS device, uh, SD-WAN device, which is placed somewhere. And we have certain interfaces and certain zones. So we have internal zone, with the internal interface and we have external zone with the external interface and we have client and the server connected to those interfaces accordingly. Now the client initiates this session to the web server or to any other server so it sends the request. The server replies with the acknowledgement and they establish session. So from this task we can derive that the blue line shows the forward flow, the yellow line shows the reverse flow, and the green is the session. So we have forward flow, reverse flow, and we have the total session which is established between this client and this server. Now, how our devices identify the forward and the reverse flows? Let's take an example. Uh, let's say that we have host 1 and host 2 which needs to establish connection to each other and host 1 establishes connection through the uh, through the SD-WAN branch 1 so the traffic goes through the SD-WAN engine 1 it goes through the internet somewhere to the SD-WAN uh, branch 2a and goes to the host if the default gateway of the host number 2 is pointing to the branch 2a the return traffic will go exactly the same way and from the perspective of the branch one, we will consider yellow and green flows as the forward and reverse flows as it's shown on the graph in here. From the perspective of the branch 2A, we will see the yellow line as the forward flow, the green one as the reverse flow, which is going the reverse direction. And we will not see this information on the branch 2B because they do not exchange the state of the sessions uh, between them in the active-active configuration. Now let's review another example. Let's say that in this example the host number 2 points uh, its default gateway configuration to the branch 2B. In this case, when host 1 establishes connection to the host number 2 and the return traffic goes back, it will go through the branch 2B and from the perspective branch 1, we will see yellow flow as the forward, green one as the reverse flow, but from the perspective of the branch 2A and the branch 2B, we will see both of these flows as the forward flows. This is because the SD-WAN device and SD-WAN engine on each of these branches will define any first matching of the communication between two hosts at the forward flow. As we didn't see any traffic on the branch 2B, to be initiated initially, we consider that this is just the initiation of the session and it will be considered as the forward flow on the branch 2B. Now, the rule configuration inside of the policies can be derived or can be uh, separated into three different sections. Those sections are name, uh, second is going to be the match criteria and the enforcement of what we're doing with this match criteria. Let's review them in details, each of them. The rule section will have only the name and the description. So technically you can reference this rule or just name it, the, uh, it somehow and make it a description for what kind of traffic you creating this rule. In the match criteria section, 
it's going to be the source destination, headers, appliances, URL, applications, URL, user groups, hoarding profiles, and so on. For example, in the source and destination, you can match traffic based on the source zone, destination zone, maybe source site name or maybe destination site name. You can use the source and destination addresses. So uh, multiple ways how you can match the traffic. In the headers section, you can match traffic based on the service list. So basically on the top of five where we can define services, just like in the Linux ETC services, uh, where you have the list of the well-known ports, so this is going to be the same uh, ETC services file, which will just show you well-known applications such as HTTP or maybe DNS, uh, DHCP and so on and so forth. Also in here, you can match based on the IP version. So you can match only IPv4 or IPv6 traffic. You can match based on the DSCP values from the QoS. Or maybe you uh, want to match based on the TTL value where you can specify that only traffic which has exactly this time to leave and in the IP header should be forwarded a certain way. And also on this screen, we can create a scheduler when this rule will be active. For example, you can say that only during business hours on the weekdays, this rule should be active or maybe only during the weekends or maybe during certain hours at night or at day. So you can define your own uh, schedulers and the time frames when this rule can be active. Another way to match uh, something is we can do this based on the deep back inspection and the application list where you can define or select from the list of 3500 applications that we provide. Or you can do the same based on the SAS uh, application groups. Um, another match condition which can be used is the URL category or you can define your own URLs which will be matched uh, to steer the traffic certain way. You can also define to steer the traffic for different users def uh, differently. So you can select uh, certain users when you have integration with the LDAP or maybe with the Active Directory or maybe even created local users and define that that specific user sh uh, and traffic from that user should be forwarded a certain way. Another way to match is by the forwarding class. So when you use combination of the QoS and the uh, and the SD1, if you want to just do the match on the QoS and then steer the traffic according to the QoS settings, you can use the forwarding class uh, match criteria in the rules. Uh, once again, if you're not familiar with the QoS configuration in the Versa, it's better not to use it. So this menu is more like for the advanced users who uh, well understand what is the QoS, what are the forwarding classes and how to use it. Anyway. The match operations, when you use multiple match criteria within the same match category, for example, in here I defined source address, source prefix 1 and source prefix 2. This will be treated as the OR condition. So whether it's going to be matched based on the first so prefix or the second prefix, in any case, it will work, um, it will, um, work as the match condition. But if you select conditions in the two different windows, for example, we select something in the source address and maybe something in the source zone together, they work as the end condition. It means that in this case, this rule will work only when the source prefix and the source zone together match or another source prefix and interface LAN zone will match together. The same will work with all the match conditions in all of them. So if you specify the match condition in multiple places, all of those places needs to match in order for this rule to be matched and work with the enforced condition. Lastly, uh, let's talk about the enforcement. So the enforcement, what we can do after the rule was created. In the enforce menu, which is the last in the rule creation, we have four subsections. Those subsections are going to be forward subsection, monitor subsection, logging and TCP optimization. In case of forwarding, you can select whether to forward traffic or maybe you want to block it. And also you can specify the forwarding profile, which should be used uh, for this um, for this match traffic. The next top IP address and routing instance will review on the next slide, but uh, for now let's switch to the other um, sections. In the monitor section, you can define uh, what should be monitored for this rule to be active. 
So let's say that you uh, define that your traffic should be steered across internet with the failover to the MPLS. And uh, you can monitor some address on the internet. When you see that the monitor doesn't work, you can select the action, for example, to skip this rule and go to the second rule uh, next to it. So that's where the monitor can be used, whether this rule should be active or not. In the logging section, you can specify where to log information about the traffic steering and which events uh, uh, should trigger the logging of information. Events can be like never log anything about the traffic steering or maybe when the SD1 uh, priority or SLA priority changes or maybe circuit changes. So you can specify this in the, um, in the logging event section. And in the TCP optimization, we can define how to optimize TCP traffic. So of course, for the TCP optimization is not part of this um, of this video. Um, probably it would require a separate video, which would last like minimum an hour to explain how the TCP optimization works. But for the future reference, you can use TCP optimization from this menu. Now, as I promised, we will go into more details and discuss the next hop IP address settings on the next slides. There are two ways how you can steer the traffic which is not destined to the SD1. You can steer the traffic through the SD1 policies rules, which can be reached through the services menu, SD1 and policies. Or you can also use PBF or PBR in Cisco terminology, policies rules which are available in the network PBF section. What is PBF and what it allows you to do? So when you have some traffic, let's say that you have traffic which is coming from the internet phase one and it's going to the interface number two as the next hop. And maybe you don't want it to go based on the routing. You want to customly or manually reroute it to the other location. For example, to the LAN three. In this case, if you want to do this, you can use PBF or SD1 rules. And that's where you can specify and use the, uh, um, and use the next hop option. So as you saw it um, in this menu, when we specify the next hop IP address, this can be used for the non SD1 traffic. And you can define what should be the next hop uh, IP address or maybe the next interface and in which routing instance the traffic should be forwarded. So that's basically where we can use the sd one traffic steering rules or PBF rules. They can, uh, you cannot use simultaneously two, um, uh, two of these components. So you cannot create sd one rules for non sd one traffic and PBF rules together. As soon as you create a single PBF rule, all the sd one rules for non sd one traffic stop working. This is hard coded inside of the system. So only SD1 rules in the, um, for the SD1 traffic will work, but PBF rules, which are created using next hop setting will stop working. So you either configure everything in the SD1 or you configure PBF rules in the PBF and SD1 rules in the SD1. Um, now, about the rules and about the forward and reverse flows. SD1 traffic, can match uh, for the SD1 traffic, you can match based on the forward and reverse flow to define how to steer each of them. But for the local traffic, which is not going to the SD1, SD1 traffic steering rules can work only with the forward flow, but it cannot uh, work with the reverse flow. And of course, you can use SD1 rules to block traffic instead of just using next generation firewall. So this will be achieved by just using the action deny flow. So you can define which applications you want to match and then you can just say uh, deny flow. Technically, it, it can be used interchangeably with the next generation firewall. Of, uh, of course, NGFW has much more uh, features and much more uh, conditions, but if you just simply need to block certain application, you can use it uh, with the sd wan traffic steering rules. Now, the rule order. So here is an example of the configuration where we have the sd wan config, we have policies and the rules inside of this policy. And uh, in this case, we have two rules. This is just an example of how it will work. The first rule is matching based on the HTTPS. So it's basically matching all the traffic on the port 443. The second rule is matching based on the Facebook application. So in this case, 
when we use rule number one and rule number two, rule number two will never be matched. This is because all Facebook traffic is always using uh, port 443. Because the rule number one will always be matched first, the top row will always be matched first, we will match based on the port and we will never even go to the Facebook. In this case, if you want to match something for the Facebook, you can just rearrange the rules and you can uh, drag and drop rule number two to be on the top of the list. So the top uh, rules in the list are always executed first and the second rules, uh, like everything below it, uh, executed after or checked after. Now, next section is the forwarding profiles. So the forwarding profiles, just to remind you what we're going to review here. Forwarding profiles are answering question how we are steering the traffic and they can reference SLA profiles to define when it should steer the traffic in a certain way. Forwarding profiles can be used and attached uh, to the sd one rules and in the forwarding profile we can define the circuit priorities, we can define whether the traffic should be encrypted or maybe not encrypted, we can define to enable or disable replication for their correction, maybe load balancing methods, uh, which of the circuits should be used for the local internet breakout or maybe some advanced features. So let's review each of them uh, one by one. First of all, um, we can define whether the traffic should be encrypted on or unencrypted. There are three settings for the encryption of the traffic. Settings are to always encrypt, to never encrypt the traffic and the optional. The optional configuration, when you specify the optional, it will take the config of the encryption from the interface. For example, you can define that all the traffic that goes on the MPLS should never be encrypted, while all the traffic which goes over the internet should always be encrypted. In this case, you will just set these encryption settings on the interface, but in the forwarding profile, you will specify the optional. Or if you want ultimately to configure that this type of traffic should always be encrypted, you can just explicitly specify it in here. Okay, next let's go and talk about the circuit priorities. You can define your circuits such as internet circuits, MPLS circuits and so on into different priorities. There are priorities uh, from 1 to 8 for the regular traffic, uh, the default, if you do not assign any of the links uh, or any of the paths to any of the priorities, it will get into the priority at number 9, which is the default. If any of the circuits is in the SLA violated state, it will get into the last resort option. So even when the um, path is SLA non-compliant, but if we don't have any other options, we would definitely need to use it as the last resort option. And we can assign certain circuits in the avoid circuit priority, which is priority number 11. In this case, the system will know that it should never use that circuit for steering the traffic. So by default, all circuits are in the priority 9. Uh, traffic is always forwarded via the circuits with the best or the lowest priority. And you can have multiple circuits with the same priority, which will just essentially do the load balancing. So on this screenshot, you can see that in the forwarding profiles in this second screen, we have the circuit priorities. And here you can just add uh, your priority rules to create uh, association between the priority and the combination of the circuits. So let's review it in a little more details. Let's imagine that you have SD-WAN branch one, which is connected to the internet through the Comcast and through the Verizon. And we have the same on the branch number two. In this case, you can define which way you want to steer the traffic. For example, you can say that in the priority one, you will have the combination of the local circuits, such as Internet 1 and Internet 2, which is Comcast and Verizon. But for the remote, you can specify that you want to use only Verizon or maybe Verizon and Comcast, or maybe you want to use combination of them or with some other circuits and define it as the first priority. So anyway, there are multiple ways to create uh, the combination of the circuits, which will create certain priority for you. And the granularity is very low level. Next option is the reverse flow options. 
There are two main options in here. First of them is the enable symmetric forwarding. When the system sees the return flow, we can specify to always uh, f um, forward the traffic symmetrically, which means that we will not even do route lookup. We will not check any of the circuit priorities which are defined in here. We will just take the same configuration as the traffic came to our branch. So the way how it came in the forward direction, we will steer exactly the same way in the reverse direction. Let's review it in a little more details on this example. So let's say that we have two branches. They have internet connection and a PLS connection between them. We have the rule on the branch number one to send all the traffic via the internet. We want to encrypt all the traffic and we are enabling symmetric forwarding. On the second branch, we're saying that we want to send all the traffic via MPLS and we never want to encrypt it. Now, let's say the traffic was established and it went through the internet circuit. According to the rule, technically the traffic which is initiated from the host number two, which goes anywhere, should take MPLS path and we should never encrypt that traffic. But because we have enable symmetric forwarding, the return traffic will go exactly the same way as it came, ignoring rules which are configured in the forwarding profile. We just want to steer the traffic symmetrically to, um, to always take the same path with the same conditions in the return direction. Now the load balancing option. The load balancing uh, define, uh, can work only on the circuits with the same priority. For example, in here, we define that priority, not, uh, priority number one it has local MPLS circuit, but priority number two has Internet one and Internet two. If we want to do load balancing, it will never work or it will never work between the MPLS and Internet circuits. It can only work between Internet circuits. And in this case, if we want to define load balancing, uh, it will only work when MPLS circuit will be in SLA non-compliant mode. So when the MPLS circuit becomes uh, last resort priority and we have the highest priority available Internet 1 and Internet 2, only in this case we will have load balancing. And there are multiple ways how to do load balancing. So for example, we can do load balancing based on the flow. And this is, by the way, the default setting. So here it is specified in the forwarding profile on the general section. We can define to load balance per flow or per packet. If we define the load balancing per packet, the same session will be, um, will be load balanced across multiple links. And we can define as many links as we want. And the next section for the load balancing is the connection, connection selection method. We can use the default setting, which is weighted round robin, in which case we will steer and load balance traffic according to the available bandwidth on each of the WAN links. For example, if you have two links, one of them has 10 megabits available bandwidth and second has 100 megabits available bandwidth, we will send one flow over the first link and 10 flows over the second. So this option will allow you to steer the traffic based on the available bandwidth uh, in that ratio which, which is available in the configuration. Or we can select the connection selection method as high available bandwidth, which will always send new sessions over the circuit which has the most available bandwidth available for us. Uh, next section in the forwarding profiles is the recompute timer. The default value for recompute timer is 300 seconds. What this uh, parameter controls? It controls how frequently or how often we will re-read the forwarding profiles and apply it to the existing rules or maybe to the new rules. Uh, for example, if you do not have or if you have a very big recompute timer, and if one of the circuits becomes SLA violated, we will re-steer the traffic only when the recompute timer is going to be uh, out. Um, recompute timer controls uh, basically uh, how we do load balancing, which circuits we should use, whether we want to enable a replication or not enable it. And it's not recommended to set the, tra uh, the recompute timer for very low values. Like for example, the lowest value is five seconds, but it's not recommended to say, set it to five seconds because 
if you apply it to the hub uh, device, um, which has a lot of traffic and it will very frequently recompute this, it might overload the box or the sd device. The next setting is the Evaluate Continuously. The Evaluate Continuously setting controls uh, whether we should reapply the settings from this forwarding profile for the existing sessions. If you don't have this selected, we will just define how the traffic should be steered when the session begins and we will never take, uh, take into account the SLA violation of any of the circuits. So if you want existing flows to be re-evaluated every recompute timer, you need to specify evaluate continuously. Next, let's review the replication, what it is and how it works. So this animation shows you when we have traffic between the New York and Santa Clara offices. We send packet number one, packet number two, for example, it was lost somewhere. Packet number three, once again, was received on the remote side. Packet number four goes and everything is good. And then again, something happens with the packet number five because of the condition of this link and it wasn't delivered to the remote side. So that's what will happen if we do not use replication. But if we enable replication, the traffic which will be sent between New York and Santa Clara is going to be duplicated or replicated across multiple links. And if one of the packets is lost in one of the locations, it will still be delivered over the redundant path. So we will always make sure that the traffic is always delivered on the remote side. Okay, so as you can see here, for example, packet number five was lost on the broadband, but it was still delivered over the MPLS. Now, the configuration of the replication, once again, is controlled in the forwarding profile and there are multiple settings which can be enabled. For example, uh, replication factor, the implicit value is two, which means that we will replicate the traffic over two links with the highest priority. In this case, actually with the lowest priority, uh, which will be uh, like the highest in the hierarchy. The default setting is to replicate over two circuits. We can make the replication uh, maximum over four circuits in this configuration. We can control when the replication is going to be enabled. We can specify always enable or if we use SLA profiles, uh, we can enable a replication only when all the circuits violate, uh, violate SLA priority uh, as, um, are SLA violated. Or similarly, uh, we can disable replication when one of the circuits uh, reaches certain, certain circuit utilization. So you can specify the percentage in here, for example, 80%. When the circuit is loaded more than 80% of its available bandwidth, we should stop replication over that circuit. And of course, there is one more option, which is called reorder. This option is used with the replication and with the uh, per packet load balancing. On the receiving side, we will always know the order of packets. And if we received some packets out of order because of the replication or maybe because of some other factors, we will wait to reorder packets and send them out exactly in the same order as they were sent. So that's about the replication. Next, let's review the forward error correction. Forward error correction works in the way that for each for example, for number of packets, we will generate certain parity data. In this graphic representation, we see that the packet number three was lost. So we have packet number one, two, and packet number three, for example, because of the, pack, uh, of the uh, packet loss on the link, it was lost. But because we sent parity data for the number of packets which was sent, out of that packet, we can recover the lost packet. It works exactly in the same way as the principle for the RAID 5 if you worked with the storage systems. The configuration for the third error correction is configured in the forwarding profile. In here you can enable it and in the enabled uh, section when you enable it you can specify first of all uh, the maximum um, of the number of the packets for which we will generate forward error correction packets. The implicit default value is four packets. 
we can uh, specify when we want to enable for the correction. Maybe you want to use it always, or we only want to enable it when uh, the path becomes a slave violated, just to remediate the situation. Maybe you have some branch which only has one uh, connection, like one internet connection, and there is no way to fail over traffic to some other location. Uh, to some other circuit. In this case, you can specify to enable for the correction if we see packet loss uh, and the uh, uh, link becomes slave violated. Now, in the forward error correction, we can specify how many forward error correction packets will be sent. Maybe you want to send, uh, maybe you want to duplicate this information uh, on multiple circuits. Or maybe you want to send forward error correction information on the alternative circuit only to not overload the existing circuit. And of course, we have the uh, re uh, receiver side option. By default, uh, we always receive forward error correction packets and we always recover them um, on, on the receiving side. So that's about forward error correction, how it works and how it can be enabled. Next is the next hop setting. So in the forwarding profile, you can define next hop setting. This is considered advanced configuration where you can define where the traffic should be steered and what should be the uh, next hop of that traffic. For example, let's say that you have all the traffic which is steered across the uh, SD1 to the branch A and from there it goes to the internet, like a central uh, internet breakout point. But for certain traffic, for example, for the Office 365, you want to make sure that the traffic should go only via the local circuit. Or the same can be defined. For example, you can define that all traffic should go over the local DIA circuit and um, everything else should go through the, uh, through the remote location. So in this case, you can define in the next hop settings the priorities of the local and remote, uh, remote DIA settings. So you can say that priority number one is going to be the uh, local site with the local WAN link one. But with the priority number two, you can define the remote uh, DIA link on the, on the gateway or the data center which should be used for the traffic in case if the priority one is by SLA violated. So that's it about the forwarding profiles. Now let's review the SLA profiles and actually before we even review SLA profiles, we need to review how the SLA probes in the Burst SD1 work. Uh, first of all, we have once again rules which will answer the question what needs to be uh, steered, then we define how it should be steered, over which circuits, with which conditions and which DIA circuits should be taken if it's internet bound traffic. And we define when it should be steered a certain way by the SLA profiles. And the SLA profiles, they are defined or they're working based on the SLA probes which are sent between all of the branches. By default, we send SLA probes between each of the branches and each of the available paths every two seconds. This can be changed so you can define uh, as frequently as you want. You can even say uh, that you want to send SLA probes in the sub-seconds or you can define to send them um, every like 10 or 20 seconds, so it's up to you. Each of the probes is actually using protocol uh, Y1731 for the probes encapsulation and all the probes are going to be IPsec encrypted. This is purposely done so uh, hackers or intruders cannot identify whether it, if, whether it is SLA probe or maybe it is the actual traffic because the attack may be to block all the SLA probes and in this way um, all the traffic will go through a different path which, uh, which for example is going to be beneficial for the hacker or intruder. By default, all the SLA probes between the branches will be marked with the DSCP value of the expedited forwarding. And each of the probe is approximately 200 bytes in size. If to be more precise is 194 bytes over IPv4 and a little more than 200 bytes over IPv6, just because of the size of the IPv6 header. Now, to graphically illustrate how this works, let's imagine that we have two branches and they have two connections between them. Internet and MPLS connection. So the branch A by default, we'll send probes to the branch uh, number two 
every two seconds and we will receive a reply from the branch number one uh, right away. So as soon as branch two receives some SLA probe, it will reply right away to the branch number one. But at the same time, branch number two will also send SLA probes to the branch number one. So they will simultaneously probe each other. And once again, locally we can control only how frequently we send SLA probes, but we cannot select how frequently the branch number two will send SLA probes. So we're just sending and the replies are automatic. They're just coming right away. So we cannot control how we're sending replies. We can only uh, control how we are sending our own SLA probes. Now, there is a second type of SLA probes. SLA probes between branches and controllers. Each branch will monitor reachability to each of the controllers. And by default, every probe will be sent every 10 seconds. And once again, this can be changed. The probes used are exactly the same as between the branches, but in this case, it will be sent every 10 seconds. And we are marking those probes with the DSCP value CS6. So it's like one of the most prioritized uh, traffic which can be in your network. Example in here, branch will constantly monitor controller every 10 seconds. And if we have multiple controllers, we will monitor those controllers um, all the time as well. And once again, by default, we're monitoring every 10 seconds each of the links. For example, uh, when you controlling uh, your branch from the Versa director uh, and the controller is defining which way to send this traffic to the Versa director, this can be based on the SLA probes. And the same when the branch needs to send something to the director, it's also going to be established based on the SLA probes uh, to the controllers. And by the way, don't forget that each of the controllers will also monitor each other. So even the controllers will establish connection to each other over the virtual SD-WAN and they will check which way to reach each other to, uh, to basically replicate the data which each of them has. So that's about the SLA probes. Now, some of the optimization methods which we are using. Imagine the following situation. In this example, we have three branches and we have a, a hub location. By default, we will send probes every two seconds from each of them to each of them if this is the full mesh configuration. Uh, there might be multiple various uh, topologies such as full mesh, hub and spoke, spoke, hub, hub, spoke, and so on. So there are uh, very, very many um, different types of the, um, of the topologies that we can select, but that's uh, not the part of the current uh, presentation that's, uh, that should be covered in a different session. So for now, let's just take an example when we have a full mesh configuration and each of the branches is sending uh, probes every two seconds to every other member of the SD-WAN network. You can see that there are a lot of probes. Imagine if we have a network which consists of hundreds of branches and each of them will send probes to each other every two seconds. So if we have 100 branches, each of them has only one link and we are sending probes every two seconds, it will take approximately one megabit of the bandwidth on each of the branches to just send a slave probes. This is a big amount, especially if you have like T1, E1 link. So basically you will load all that link with only SLA probes. And in the full mesh configuration, this is not a desirable configuration. So specifically for this, we created technology which is called adaptive SLA monitoring. How it works and what can be configured in the uh, adaptive SLA monitoring. Uh, you can specify that when there is no activity between branches, for example, within 300 seconds or five minutes, which is the default timer, we want to suspend SLA probes between those branches for a certain amount of time. And once again, all of these parameters are reconfigurable, so you can configure them as uh, frequent as you want. And of course, um, you can specify the number of retries which can be used um, every suspend interval. So let's imagine that we have two branches, branch one and branch two, 
we the system see that there is no traffic between those branches within five minutes last five minutes in this case it will switch the sla monitoring to the adaptive sla monitoring uh, state and in this state we will send three probes every 30 seconds and we need to send this number of probes just to define what is the jitter so if we wouldn't need to uh, calculate the jitter technically we wouldn't need to send uh, this number of probes every uh, every 30 seconds and once again this can be reconfigured and this can be modified according to your needs what can be measured by the sla probes or which sla metrics are available for us we can calculate first of all the round trip delay or the regular delay between the branches we can define or we can identify what is the jitter or the difference between delays so let's say that if you have one sla probe which returned within 10 milliseconds and second uh, sla probe which returned within 30 milliseconds the difference between them is 20 milliseconds for the voice traffic this is a very bad condition so we don't want jitter to be uh, a large value for the voice traffic and the jitter is something that can be measured with the SLA uh, probes in our system. And lastly, we can calculate the forward and reverse packet loss. And this can be done in two ways. First of all, we can calculate uh, SLA, uh, the, the loss on the link based on the number of probes which we lost. But this is not a very good method. And actually, this is the method which is used by all other competitors. In case of Versa, we can also calculate packet loss based on the actual traffic, not only on the SLA probes and how many of those we lost like all other vendors. In this case, we can calculate what is the actual traffic, the number of packets which was sent, data packets from the users from one branch to another and in the return direction. Just to illustrate how this works, let's see this example. So let's say that we have branch A and branch B and branch a is sending SLA probe to the branch B and inside of the SLA probe we will have information that let's say that I sent you since the last SLA probe 100 packets and uh, I send them in the traffic class for example EF so we're sending this information to the branch B and in reply the branch B will reply with the information hey branch A uh, so you informed me that you sent me 100 packets but I only received 98 packets which means that there is a 2% packet loss in the forward direction from the branch A to the branch B so this information is going to be sent to the branch A in the return information and once again this is something that only Versa can do. There is no other Esteban vendor which can calculate the packet loss based on the actual traffic. So this is a very big distinguisher for the Versa SD1 solution. Now let's review SD1 uh, SLA path policies, what it is and how it is used. So SD1 uh, or SLA path policies control how frequently you will send SLAs between branches. So you can configure in the path policies frequency, adaptive SLA parameters, QoS settings for the SLA probes, how many probes are going to be sent to each peer and so on and so forth. Path policies, when you create them, they can be reused for multiple paths. We will review this later. Uh, but now uh, let's just go into a little more details of what can be configured in the uh, path policies uh, in the Versa sd one So first of all, you can, you can define each of the branches and assign it to the individual spoke groups. By default, everybody is in the same spoke group, but we can uh, redefine them and reassign to their individual spoke groups. Let's say that branch one and branch two is going to be in the group spokes while branch three is going to be in the group mesh and the uh, hub is going to be in the group hubs you can assign device to the specific uh, um, sd1 gro group in the sd1 section in the site configuration in the group membership so in here you can just add what is going to be the group for this specific branch next when we create path policies 
So let's say that we went to the SD-WAN path policies, we opened or created path policy, we opened the term inside of that policy, we can specify to which branches or to which groups we're sending SLA probes in this condition. So let's say that uh, we want to create path policy only for the group mesh or only for the group spokes or only for the group hubs. So this can be defined in here. And once again, the, um, the, uh, the system will check uh, terms in the hierarchical order. So the first, uh, first hit, first match. So it will first check the top rule, then the next rule, the next, 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 next. So if you want to match specifically on a specific group, uh, you should place that term at the top of the list before you will have a wildcard match. Now, you can apply path policies in the SD-WAN site configuration where you will have SD-WAN interfaces which can be used for the SD-WAN traffic. So you can define that, for example, interface 0 and 1 uh, are the only interfaces which should be used for the SD-WAN traffic. Or, uh, for example, uh, you can define that all of the interfaces should be used for the SD-WAN traffic for this specific tenant. And the information about the tenant is going to be at the top. The information about the, uh, about the interfaces which should be used in the SD-WAN for this specific tenant is going to be in here. And we will attach the, um, the um, SD-WAN path policies or SLA monitoring policies which are created in the path policies to the interfaces in here, which will define how the traffic is going to be steered. Now let's review where it's configured in the path policies, uh, how we are steering and how we're sending traffic. As we just reviewed on the previous slides, uh, in the path policies, when we create certain term, we can specify uh, how we send traffic to the special groups, or we can also create special configuration for SLA probes, which are coming from the local circuits to the specific remote circuits. So you can control how frequently you will send SLA probes, for example, to the LTE links, because usually customers don't want to do this very frequently, and that's uh, where they can configure separate um, SLA probes, which will be going to the LTE only. Uh, next, in the action window, when we actually configure uh, the SLA probe, we can configure in which of the forwarding classes or what is the QoS settings for the SLA probes which we will be sending, whether it's going to be expedited forwarding or maybe best effort or maybe CS6 or some other. We can configure as many um, SLA probes as we want. So we can, for example, send not only one probe per two seconds, but we can send two, three, four probes and we can define frequency for each of them. You can define global frequency for all SLA probes, which is going to be in the SLA monitoring in this window. In this case, when you do not specify anything in the more specific configuration, it will be taken from the global configuration. Also, you can configure adaptive SLA monitoring here, enable or disable. For example, in this probe, adaptive SLA monitoring is already enabled, but in the global, it's not enabled. So we can specify for some of the probes to enable adaptive SLA and for some of them not to enable it. And the frequency, first of all, the frequency of the probes is configured in the milliseconds. So 2000 milliseconds means every two seconds by default in the, expedi uh, in the expedited forwarding traffic class. If you want, you can reconfigure it to any other value. So, and the parameters for the SLA probes are how frequently we're sending them, how frequently we're sending information to the analytics about our SLA probes and what was defined there, and the loss threshold. For example, if you have two branches and you are sending SLA probes and do not receive any, uh, any replies, we can define how many probes should be lost for us to consider this path as unavailable completely. So the default implicit value is 3. So it means that we can identify by default that the path is unavailable for us within 6 seconds maximum. Uh, that was about the SLA probes and how we can configure them and how they work. Next, we finally came to the SLA profiles, which are using SLA probes and which are working based on the SLA probes. 
slave profiles are the ones which can be attached to the forwarding profiles to configure or control when the traffic should be steered certain way. We can configure unlimited number of SLA probes, uh, but at the same time only one SLA profile, uh, I'm sorry, we can configure unlimited number of SLA profiles. And SLA profiles are just the thresholds that we are defining based on the SLA probes. SLA profiles do not generate any additional SLA traffic. It's only defining the thresholds which should be used by the forwarding profiles based on the SLA probes which we are sending. Um, let's review in details which, what can be configured in each of the SLA profiles. First of all, there are two main sections in the profile. The first section, which defines the maximum threshold for the path to consider it SLA compliant and or non-compliant, where you can define, for example, when the maximum packet loss reaches 10%, on that link, it should be considered SLA non-compliant and forwarding profiles should take some action to fill over to some other location. Uh, and by the way, if we do not attach any SLA profile to the forwarding profile, uh, the failover between circuits will happen only when we have complete loss of the path, like within six, six seconds. Uh, the second section here, or the section number two, controls how we load balance the traffic. For example, let's say that you have uh, two links with the same priority, Internet 1 and Internet 2. And by default, we will load balance them equally. But if you want to use only the one of them, which, have the, which has the lowest delay or maybe lowest latency or lowest packet loss, we can define it in here. If the difference between equal paths is less than 10%, we will, uh, we will load balance across both of them. But if the difference between them is more than 10%, we will select the one with the best metrics. If you select multiple checkboxes in here, we will use the internal uh, formula to calculate the best, um, the best value for a certain path. And if the difference between paths is more than 10%, the one with the lowest difference is gonna be used to, for the steering of your traffic. So that's what we can configure in the general section. In the SaaS application monitoring section, that's like more advanced configuration, which is based on the SaaS application monitor. So you can configure uh, monitor probes, like for example, in the network SaaS application monitor, you can configure probes to monitor specific addresses. For example, Google.com or certain um, applications such as, um, such as Facebook or some other for which you're creating a rule. And then you can define that these SAS application monitor probes should be used in the SLA profiles in the SAS application monitor section. And we can define what is the maximum latency or maximum packet loss for, um, for that probe to consider it uh, SLA compliant or non-compliant. And this way we can control which way the traffic is gonna be steered, maybe through the local DA link, or maybe through the remote, through the gateway, um, when we want to select the best path for, uh, for us to reach the SaaS application on the internet. So once again, uh, SaaS application monitor probes are configured in the network section, SaaS application monitor section. I'm not gonna stay here in, um, in a lot of details because uh, next hop configuration and selective DIA configuration is probably the separate topic which would take at least an hour to explain some of the configurations. So uh, let's just go and see where we can apply SLA profiles. So the SLA profiles can be attached to the forwarding profiles in the SLA pro, uh, profile section. So. SLA profile are working based on the SLA probes between branches and we attach SLA profiles to the forwarding profiles and forwarding profiles are attached to the SD-WAN rules and that's how they interact together. If you want to attach SAS application monitor uh, SLA profiles, this can be done in the next hop configuration and that's where you configure it in here. This finalizes our video. Uh, I hope this was informative for you and thank you for watching.